let me give you an image. And I think you'll probably agree with me when I say this is the kind of thing we think of when we think of England. And we imagine these wonderful rolling hills, don't we? Little rural communities tucked away in there somewhere. Chocolate box villages. Well, it's an idyllic view. The truth is that it's a view that's changing. Farming and rural economies are changing. And as a result, things are different in the beautiful countryside of England and indeed in rural communities around the world. One of the big trends is that farm buildings have gradually fallen out of daily use on farms and so have become redundant to the farmer. What does he do? He puts them to new uses. And uh, behind me you see uh, a, a set of garden buildings. It used to be a milking parlour, now an office. Uh, one I used to occupy, in fact. Um, other farmers are putting their buildings to use with light industry, and indeed they're diversifying beyond those buildings as well. Uh, this is a local farm on which they have built a fishing lake. Uh, there are other recreational uses for farmland too. Campsites, event grounds, farming. So we still need to do that, of course, but farmers are finding increasing ways to diversify and make more income, and that has even gone so far as actually covering the farmland in solar panels. Uh, but all of these things have a challenge in common, and that challenge is that they require less labour than traditional farming. And so the reality of that is that it does have an impact on rural communities because it has an impact on employment. Uh, and in the US, this has become a significant concern that rural communities are shrinking uh, as the sons and daughters of farmers decide to make their way in cities as opposed to in the country. Uh, and in the UK, of course, we have our challenges too that often come from farmers having lack of succession. Their son or daughter doesn't want to take over the farm. They might lack funds. Uh, some farmers have been reported in this country to be selling little parcels of land every year to keep the overdraft down. This does not sit well with landowners because if you speak to a landowner about their land, a wonderful look comes into their eyes, a passion, uh, a love for that which has given them pretty much everything they have. Land to farmers is wealth, but it's more than that. It's, it is family. We do need to protect farmers' ability to hang on to their land. Now, I actually believe that right now we have an unprecedented opportunity to regenerate rural communities and rural economies. But to explain how is slightly tricky, so I'm going to take you on my journey, how I found this out. And it started without me, 10 years ago, uh, in a dilapidated village. And uh, the dilapidated village is on the screen there in the background, and uh, in, a, in a forest in central Bulgaria. And two people that I have had the privilege of knowing, uh, and who I consider visionaries, had a vision to create a new kind of rural development in this location. And they began building, and what they began building was a community. It was designed as a kind of hamlet, a retreat, somewhere that people could go and rest, recharge, reconnect with nature, and reconnect with history and local crafts. Not your average development, if I may use the word I hate, the development. Not your housing estate plonked down in the middle of the country to the angst of all of those people that happen to live near it. The idea with this wasn't to shun technology or modern architecture or anything like that, but to use it differently, to seamlessly integrate it with tradition. Today, the village of Gesha View is almost complete, and it includes 180 homes. I think you'll agree they did a beautiful job. This is a more significant image than it looks for two reasons. The first is the rock in the foreground. That rock came from the site. Whilst it was moved around the site, it never left. New rock hasn't been brought in. This site works with the landscape that it sits in. It's not a case of big lorries turning up and plonking something down. And similarly, you've got trees, mature trees on the site. Those have been there since the beginning. This was built in a forest, remember, and only 22 trees had to be felled in the process. On the surface, the architecture is pretty understated. It's a traditional Bulgarian vernacular um, with 
balconies that are made in dark wood, very, very traditional local thing. Uh, and the furniture inside these houses is made by Bulgarian craftsmen. There's an awful lot of Bulgaria uh, in this architecture. But underneath this is technology. And that's really the fusion that I'm talking about. The centerpiece of this development is called the courtyard. I heard an ooh, and I don't blame you because it's phenomenal. I kid you not, when I first went there, this is how you get in to Gesha View. And when I first went there and walked into this courtyard, I was struck dumb for two days. It's something to take in. It has the same proportions as the Vienna Opera House uh, and amazing acoustics. It contains a library, a conference centre, 23 shops, uh, a, a great number of one-bedroom sort of hotel room come apartments. Um, but most importantly, it forms a cultural centre. Now, have you ever heard the words cultural centre uttered without a connection to a city? Well, there's no reason, is there, why rural communities shouldn't be cultural centres. And this aimed from the very beginning to be one. It challenges our perceptions of things like European capital of culture. Imagine giving that to a village. Well, Gesher View is nearly complete and is poised to open with Ramada hotels. But why am I telling you all of this? What's interesting about it? And why as an astronomer did I even end up there? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the madman that built it decided that the roofs on these houses, some of them should come off. And you can see an example of that centre screen. And I was called out there to sell them a telescope to put in that gap, which I would have been more than happy to do had we had a good view of the sky from that gap. Now, actually, as it turns out, I mean, I just had to see it. That was why I went out there. I was going, come on, you've got to, got to see it. So I jumped on EasyJet and off I went. But this wasn't an ideal place for stargazing, and I had to tell them so. But do you know what? I thought to myself, this ethos of community in a rural place I have never come across before, and I want to be involved. And I said, is there anywhere else we could do a bit of astronomy? Is there somewhere we could maybe build an observatory dedicated to the task? And they showed me that, which doesn't look like a lot. But this is a very, very special place. This is a hillside. It's about a hectare, which, for those who don't know, is 100 by 100 metres, roughly, in size. And this is a hillside that overlooks nothing other than more hillsides. There is, from this site, not another building to be seen. It has, I can tell you firsthand, the most amazing sky. And so that day we hatched a plan to build a community here that would preserve this fantastic natural environment, this completely untouched landscape, but also allow people to come and see it. We thought to ourselves, well, we could just put a big observatory, like everybody else does, a research observatory on the site. But no, that wasn't the answer. The key point here for us was a community to create something that was inclusive. A village for every kind of astronomer. That's what we designed. It has to be a melting pot for knowledge and education. It has to connect astronomers together, researchers with amateurs, with children, to make this thing work. And we designed some interesting looking houses. These are bungalows with an observatory. Well, actually, they're an observatory with a bungalow because the first lesson we learned was you build the observatory first and then you put other things around it because you really need to make sure that that has the absolute right conditions. The heart of the village here is uh, a research observatory uh, which will sit at the top of the hill but isn't going to dwarf everything. This is uh, about a 400 square metre structure that includes conferences, classrooms, labs, uh, and of course, a nice big telescope. And we, of course, needed a, somewhere for people to go and do what people do. So this is our visitor centre, which includes restaurant, bar, reception, conference hall. And something you'll notice if you look at this image is that it's on stilts. Everything on this site is on stilts. Because remember I said we wanted to preserve the site. And building on a site isn't necessarily at odds with that aim of preserving nature. Everything on this site is merely screwed to the ground. It's all removable. And that's a key plank of it. Uh, this is 
what it looks like in the reception after dark. Uh, this is missing a reception desk, because you'll have to imagine the lady standing there who stood at a reception desk. But what you're seeing here, uh, you'll notice very tight, discrete pools of light under each of the lamps. There is no standard for dark sky-friendly lighting that covers indoor lights. And we wanted this place to feel light and airy in the daytime, so we put a big glass curtain wall at the end. We had to create our own design standard, we called it Dark by Design, that governs the use of the interior lights so that the nature outside of that glass curtain wall could carry on without worrying whether it was day or night. It's not a traditional commercial venture, underlined. Income from the ultimate sale and rental of these houses will endow an educational foundation which will run the place. It sits on three pillars, and those pillars are what everything that we, me and David and Mirahons and the remainder of the team, everything that we are doing sits on these three pillars. The first is purpose. There has to be a reason to do something here. The second is prosperity. It has to actually pay the bills. And the third is perpetuity. That has to last. It can't be grant funded and disappear after two years or fall into disrepair when the grants end. It has to work for good. We wanted to make this thing bigger than just the community that went there. So we wanted to build a global astronomy community around Sky Village. And the way that we are approaching this is, well, we decided to design ourselves a little, I don't know, Silicon Valley startup, a little dot-com unicorn of some kind. And what we thought to ourselves was, we want to make the telescopes here available to other people uh, who aren't here, first of all. Because some of the time these houses aren't going to be occupied, and when they're not, the little observatories are going to be empty, and we don't want that happening. So the first thing we did was we designed a platform that allows you to remotely operate those telescopes from somewhere else. Then we decided, hang on a minute, there are thousands of amateur astronomical telescopes around the world. Why don't we add all of those to our platform and allow you to remotely control telescopes from all around the world so you can do a little bit of astronomy in your lunch hour for the first time ever? And then we thought... Why don't we put something in here which allows you to control more than one of the telescope? Or rather, if you have a telescope, you can be part of huge observations, at which point those telescopes all around the world can be harnessed as one to form an effective lens the size of our planet. Yeah. <laughs> so we did. But what's the answer for the UK, for these farms like this one? which is actually a dilapidated pig farm of about 4,000 former pigs. They've all gone now, <laughs> won't tell you where. Uh, to an ancient, I know I've got a few vegetarians in the room, uh, an ancient event ground uh, was here, um, uh, which, which actually ceased holding country fairs 100 years ago. This place has fallen into disrepair, and it's the same problem that other farms have got, which is that there isn't the money, um, but they don't know what to do next to, t to transform this place. And the problem exists because of what I said right at the beginning, this issue of the landowner not wanting to sell. The worst thing he can imagine is selling this run-down dump of a farm to a developer. He doesn't want to see executive boxes planted on the site and then sold for the highest possible price. So the landowner and developer aren't going to coexist here, and nor is that developer going to coexist with the local community. They'd be horrified if he did sell up. Well, we took a look at this in conjunction with the local authority and the landowner. And we came up with an idea to transform the site, which includes the landowner as part of the project, rather than him having to sell land to create this thing. And so we, we thought, well, we'll put a visitor centre on there, rural education centre, catering, cookery school, 18 park homes, 10 live-work houses. It's a really nice idea of rural economy that we could bring back cottage industry. And so we also brought in cottage workshop dwellings, uh, 21 light enterprise units, 22 affordable houses, eight manor house apartments in the refurbished, listed original house on the site, a fitness centre, a stables, a sports hall. And of course, that field that used to host these wonderful 
fairs and, and, and events 100 years ago put back into use. Employment for over 60 people. Facilities that reduce pressure on local public services rather than housing that adds to them. But what is the relevance of this to me, humble astronomy guy? Uh, why do I care? And I'll tell you why. Because these rural idols are no longer isolated. The arrival of fast broadband and systems like ours that allow you to link virtual with real, to connect to devices and carry out actions remotely, allow these communities to be linked to the entire world. There's no limit to this. But what it does mean is that now we can live where we want. Crucially, we can live somewhere that embraces forgotten values. We can go and live somewhere that's safe and lovely for our children, even lovelier than Mole Valley. And I know that's difficult when apparently we're the second loveliest place in England, according to last week's paper. But with facilities that aren't overstretched, with capacity to share with the wider community, and linking this to the local community, integrating it technologically into the global community. This is about creating new communities where old communities existed. But crucially, it's about creating communities with purpose, prosperity, and perpetuity. Thank you.